Islanders, shall I say, to the Coast to Corals online edition. Hopefully everyone's having a great April so far. It's been a pretty easy one in my heart. Tonight we have a pretty funky speaker, if I would use that word. It's uh, Saw Shark Movement and Saw Shark Research, really. It's not anything in particular tonight. And it's from Patrick Burke, a PhD candidate at Macquarie University down in Sydney. I just want to start off this talk by um, acknowledging the traditional owners of the country to which we're all residing on virtually. Um, I want to acknowledge everybody past, present and future coming out of that as well. A quick little background info on who ReefCheck and what ReefCheck is. If you guys don't know, we're a non-profit organization based all around the world um, in a heap of different countries. We're um, a community-based organization that also, also matches with uh, citizen science. So we have, we train scuba divers, like this person on the right here, to go out and collect data on our local coral reefs. Um, we do that here in the Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast, up north as well. And then we have active volunteers who go out into our local community, say hello to some folks and preach about the problems occurring on our coral reefs and how we can mitigate the effects of climate change and anything else uh, that's unfortunately happening on in the water. So we just have a little bit of housekeeping etiquette in case it's anybody's first Zoom meeting. Um, if you could please just mute your video and your microphone while we're giving the presentation, just so the bandwidth um, is a little great and there's no interruptions as well. If you have any questions as we go, please feel free to use the chat box. Our friend Erland, who's a co-host tonight, and another volunteer will be helping out with any questions. So we're a pretty small group tonight, just under 20 people. Um, maybe as we go, uh, we can answer questions and we'll just interrupt Patrick as he speaks. And just before we kick off as well, we always have a group photo. So if you guys wanted to start preparing now, make sure your hair is looking nice and tidy and your dog's not in the background or is in the background, whatever you prefer really. Um, and change your name on Zoom as well if you want to reign anonymous because we will be posting a photo of it on our social media pages. Everybody to see. I just want to give a quick couple of shout outs before we kick off to any upcoming events in our local area. Um, so on the Sunshine Coast, um, I think Oh, did that already happen? That's the wrong date, sorry. Um, we have beer yoga coming up from at Your Mates Brewery. It happens every month. It's an amazing, amazing um, event. I am sometimes there, so you'll get to see my pretty face. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's yoga poses mixed with some delicious beverages. And it's at the brew house in Kiwana as well. Chat box, it's going crazy. The 19th, sorry Jody, my mistake. I put in the wrong date, that's today. It's one week from now, so it's definitely the 19th. Um, this one's a little bit further away, it's Pramfest, and this actually has the right date, 4th, 5th and the 6th of June. So Pranfest is out in Imbul, which is in the hinterland of the Sunshine Coast. I was actually camping there last weekend. It is a beautiful area. Um, and this sounds like a really great festival. Reef Check Australia is the main nonprofit organization that will be at this festival. Um, so get on down there if you have nothing better to do. Um, and if you do, you should and get on down there, this is definitely better. There's gonna be music, yoga, breath work, meditation, lots of dancing, different workshops, and a ton of different artists. 
is just to go down there. And for anybody calling in from a little bit further away, Brisbane, we have another yoga event, which is on tomorrow. Uh, gin and yoga instead of beer yoga. Um, same idea, different space. It's at Warehouse 25, I believe it is. And um, yeah, this should be a fun evening. I haven't gone to this one actually. And then we also have, who I think is on the call tonight, um, next month we have uh, Marine Archaeology, which I am just as excited about as our online talk for the month. So make sure you scratch that into your diaries. In case you were wondering how all of us are here tonight, we are all uh, Reef Check ambassadors. So we go through a small amount of volunteer training and they're set loose in the world to make our oceans and planet a better place, really. Um, we have two types of volunteering that you can help out with Reef Check. We have being a citizen science volunteer diver, which is a little more technical. Um, if you're a rescue diver or above, you can apply to be one of them. We only host a couple courses each year. So if you are interested, please hop on the Facebook page or get in contact on our website. And you can be our Reef Check Ambassador, which is what I and many other people on this call are, where um, you hop in on local community events and preach about the wonderful work that we do and hopefully engage with the community and talk to them about ways they can improve their lifestyle to be less harmful for our oceans. And we are also on all social media sites, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. If you haven't already, please give us a follow. We post all uh, upcoming events, any shout outs, anything that's happening on in the Reef Check world, it will be coming up on our social media site. So if you wanna stay up to date with anything cool that we do, because why wouldn't you, go give us a follow. And one last little thank you. Um, obviously, it takes um, more than a village to keep these talks and Reef Check Australia as an organization going. So we wanna give a huge shout out to Sunshine Coast Council, the Clean Water Group, Mask Events, Townsville Council, Brisbane Council, and the Gold Coast Council. Um, none of us would be here tonight without um, everybody else lending a hand with us and it does make a huge difference at the end of the evening so without further ado oh one last shout out as well <laughs> as always i do want to give a huge massive thank you on top of all our sponsors to our volunteers this photo needs a bit of an update we're having a bit of a volunteer group change for this series um, but regardless if your face is in this photo or not, we want to give you a huge thank you. And because this is virtual, you can give yourself a pat on the back. I'll give you a virtual clap at the end of the evening if you like. And to the most exciting part and the reason everybody else is here for is tonight's speaker. So tonight is about Patrick Burke, he's a PhD candidate and a marine ecologist at Macquarie University in Sydney. His research mainly focuses on two different source shark species around the southeastern part of Australia. He was from the USA and he's done an undergraduate degree there as well as a degree in Belgium and another in Australia, because why not? The majority of his work is based on the ecology of sharks and rays and his research that he's currently um, working on and what he'll be talking about tonight is um, tagging and biochemical traces in saw sharks as well as a lot of different research. So without me explaining any more, um, I'll hand it over to you, Patrick. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, no and thanks everybody else for coming out. 
stop sharing now and see if you can share your screen. Yeah. How are we going? This is everybody see this part? We sure can. Thank right. you. All that Zoom training is paying off. <laughs> it sure cool. is. Well, uh, yeah, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about um, some of the research I've been doing over the past um, two years or so on saw sharks around Australia. Um, and this is again at Macquarie University. And a lot of our research has been funded by uh, the Save Our Seas Foundation, which is a, a great uh, nonprofit organization that funds a lot of uh, shark and ray specific research. Um, and we are very thankful for all their, uh, their funding and their efforts towards my project specifically. Um, and yeah, saw sharks as a whole. Um, so yeah, we're talking about tagging, aging, and what happens when you can CT scan a shark. Um, let's see. Ah, there we go. Sweet. Yeah. So uh, as Paula said, uh, my name is Patrick Burke. Most people know me as Patty. Um, yeah, PhD candidate, Macquarie. Um, my research is focused on a variety of different stuff around saw sharks, um, mostly the ecology. So tagging. Um, and what ecology actually means, again, is uh, trying to understand how an organism essentially interacts and fits into its uh, respective food webs. So whether that's tagging, tagging or looking at um, their diet, things like that. Um, so that's generally where my research uh, is focused on, but we do get into a bit of other things when we have time and when uh, COVID isn't um, you know, making research impossible. But it's a lot of fun. So today, what we'll be talking about is first off, I'm just going to give a brief introduction of what a saw shark actually is. Uh, I know a few people at home might be thinking of sawfish, and it is a little spoiler here that we are not talking about sawfish today. A um, bit about tagging. Um, so what happens when you satellite tag sharks, or saw sharks specifically, and if that's even a possible thing to do. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about aging, how you age sharks, and uh, my interesting experience with trying to age saw sharks. Um, and their own little birthdays, their birthday cakes, uh, and then a bit of uh, CT scanning saw sharks, um, which was uh, tied to our aging research, but we actually ended up um, finding out some pretty novel and uh, exciting research um, basically by accident. So I'll tell you a little bit about that story. Um, but yes, right, with no further ado, what actually is a saw shark? Well, saw sharks are often mistaken, um, mainly mistaken for their doppelgangers, the uh, the sawfish, and even likely now, I suspect some of you at home are thinking of sawfish. Um, fair enough as well. Most of you are from uh, Queensland, where you guys do actually have one of the few remaining um, what we call lifeboat populations of sawfish up there. So that's great for you guys and great for sawfish. But we are actually talking about saw sharks today, um, and it's a regular mistake. So hopefully, we're gonna we're gonna iron that out first, and then we can talk about some of the research. So this is one of my two study species. Um, this beautiful little shark is the common saw shark, the Pristuphorus serratus. Um, and the defining characteristic for these guys is this uh, really impressive tooth rostrum of the saw. Um, this is also the main reason why these guys get confused with sawfish, because uh, as you'll see in a second, they're similar structures, but if you look closely, there are a few differences. Um, one of the main ones is that these guys actually have these string-like structures that come off um, the rostrum about halfway down. Um, they're known as barbels, so things like catfish have barbels, goatfish have barbels. Um, I like to think of these as the little Fu Manchu mustache on the saw sharks, um, but it's one of the easy distinguishing characteristics between the two groups. But again, I think we just need to have a few more pictures. Um, my talk is going to try to be pretty informal about a lot of things and hopefully uh, fill with lots of pictures that are a bit more exciting than just listening to me drone on about um, my own research, so I hope you guys enjoy some of the pictures. Um, and first up with this side by side is the, the saw shark. The saw shark over here. Um, this is again that the Prussian Forest Rouse, the common. And over here is um, a sawfish actually from um, some good friends of mine up, uh, actually, your guys' way, a group called Sharks and Rays Australia. They do some really great work up there. Um, and if you guys look closely, they both have these saws attached to their face, but you might notice a few little differences between them. But to be fair, how many fish are actually swimming around in the ocean with a saw attached to their face, right? So it's, it makes sense that uh, people tend to confuse the groups, right? Um, it's <laughs> pretty unique, to say the least. 
Um, but some of the differences you can actually see actually come with the actual teeth on the rostrum. They're quite different. Um, we'll get into that a little bit in a second. But one of the big things that makes it easy to tell the difference between the sharks is actually the sheer size. So saw sharks are small sharks. They're adorable. So they get the maximum to about a meter and a half. If you saw a meter and a half saw shark, that's, uh, that's, that's our Bigfoot. That's our Nessie. Uh, they don't really get much bigger than that. Whereas, uh, at least more historically, sawfish, the screen sawfish, um, can actually get up to seven meters. This one here was just under six meters. Um, so really, really huge animals. Um, and their environments are a little bit different. Sawfish are usually more coastal, while uh, saw sharks are a bit more on the continental shelf and the slope, usually um, down to anywhere about 30 meters to well over 500 meters. So um, you're much more likely to run into a sawfish than you ever are a saw shark. Um, but again, yeah, the size is one of the easy ways to tell the difference between them. Um, another thing, oh, and also you can see the, the barbels, the little Fu Manchu mustache a bit better here. Um, yeah. Another thing that makes these guys different is actually the rostrum itself. So I don't know if you guys have thought about this at all, but um, one issue that comes up if you actually have essentially a saw or a chainsaw attached to your face um, there's a lot of questions that get raised on how does that actually work in terms of reproduction, in terms of being born, right? How does this structure exist without hurting the mother? Yep. Um, because as you might imagine, having um, a saw might make some of that stuff a little bit more um, logistically challenging, we'll say. So saw sharks actually do it a very, very cool way is um, this is a, is a neonate here of a southern saw shark. The teeth are actually folded into the rostrum itself. So it's essentially one long triangle. It's not sharp at all yet, nothing like that. And also here's those barbels again, except um, a bit closer. You can see the nerves that run along this. So there's a lot of sensory structures that are actually inside that rostrum itself. Where soft fish do this actually a little bit different. They actually have essentially a sheath. So think of like a sheath that you might cover a knife in your kitchen or a sword, something like that. So this is gelatinous sheet that actually covers the, um, the rostrum that allows it to be born without hurting the mother. Um, and both of these, um, these things, well, essentially in the sawfish, uh, the sheath will basically um, dissolve after a couple of days after being born, uh, and the, the saw shark uh, rostral teeth will actually fold out and become pretty formidable weapons, as you can see here, um, and again here on the sawfish itself. And one of the last little differences is actually when it, talking about the saw is that the teeth of the saw on saw sharks are actually replaceable. So if they lose any of those teeth, um, they can actually grow them back individually. So not like their jaws where they have rows and rows of teeth, they are um, selectively replaced on their saw. Whereas in saw fish, if they lose their teeth, um, they're gone for life. And also with that, they grow continuously throughout their life. So it's something that they keep and adding to, as long as they don't lose the root of their tooth. So with that, hopefully things are a little bit clearer between saw sharks and saw fish. Uh, saw sharks are true sharks. Um, that means if you look evolutionarily, um, they fall much more with all of the carcharinids, your, your larger sharks you might be more familiar with, where your sawfish are actual rays. Um, one analogy that's a bit coarse, but it's, uh, it's roughly the same is um, in terms of their evolutionary relatedness, um, they're very similar if we're actually to compare ourselves to things like platypus, like human and platypus. We're both mammals, um, but still quite a ways away in terms of evolutionary uh, descendants. And that's roughly the same amount of time that we're talking about with saw sharks and saw fish. So this is an example of what we call convergent evolution, where two animals uh, independently evolve uh, a structure. In this case, a pretty wicked saw that actually is attached to their face. <laughs> so with that, those are the saw fish, saw sharks. And today we'll be, or tonight, we'll be talking about saw sharks. Cool. Cool. So saw sharks globally, they're actually found uh, all over the ocean. Um, there's 10 different species. Um, some of these species we know almost nothing about. Some of these individuals have only been seen um, a handful of times, specifically the Bahama saw shark. Um, it's very, very rare. Um, and a lot of these other ones, again, aren't as common either. Um, there was two new species described recently, the six skill saw sharks. Um, and that was actually just a case of essentially They'd caught these things a long time ago and put them in a museum, and just nobody had actually taken the time to look at them. So it's a case of we don't know much about saw sharks just because 
people haven't really taken the time to look. Their, their animals aren't regularly seen. Again, you're not likely to see them on your snorkels, on your dives. Um, even if you're, uh, I guess maybe if you're a very intense tech diver, maybe you'll find some down deep, but um, they're really uh, not something we run into a lot. And most of the information we do know actually comes from the two species found uh, around southeastern Australia, the common and the southern saw shark, which are these two little guys, um, because they're actually a relatively regular facet in bycatch in Australian fisheries. So things like your gillnet and trawl fisheries, um, these guys do come into about 30 meters of water um, certain times of the year, and that's where they'll get, they'll get caught in gillnets. Um, and that's basically where we know most of the information is that's one of the most accessible ways for us to actually um, see these animals. Um, but with that, um, there's, there's a lot of information that we don't know. So if you guys are aware, most of our information comes from fisheries derived sources which can be a pretty biased source um, because essentially we're catching these animals where people are fishing, not exactly where these animals are going. So we really only have half of the puzzle, really. So a lot of my work is hopefully going to be filling in a lot of these gaps that we don't know, uh, particularly with the ecology side, as I was mentioning. So um, where they go and how they interact with their food webs, um, which actually takes me to uh, our first study that we did. Um, we basically carried out a pilot study we wanted to see if it was possible, or a good idea even, to, uh, to tag saw sharks with satellite tags to get a better idea of where they're going. So in terms of ecological data before this study, um, most of it again was from fisheries data. So we could see in the data that there was more animals being caught at certain areas um, in a possible seasonal uh, influence, right? So we're starting to understand that maybe their movements are being driven by some sort of uh, environmental change, right? Are they migrating for breathing? Are they migrating because it gets cold? Is that where the fish go? So we really didn't have any very much information at all. We just had the idea that they might move in the seasons, right? That's, uh, <laughs> that's uh, not a lot of information to work with. So we hoped uh, we could fill in a few of those gaps with this little pilot study that we, that we, um, that we carried out. And a little bit of background information about um, this study, we use the common saw shark. So one of the two species that I was talking about prior. Uh, and the currently described distribution, so where these animals are found, um, is essentially the entire southern half of Australia. So it's, it's a really broad range uh, from all the way over in Western Australia to, um, I think the, the tips recently been just pushed up to the southern end of Queensland. Um, so there's a lot of variability across that, a lot of variability in, in pretty much the entire environments are going to be quite different across different areas of this. Um, so again, just highlighting, we know that they occur here, but that's basically all we know. Yeah. Which took us to the pilot study where we actually went down off the northeast coast of Tadsey, of Tasmania, and we went out on a, uh, on a boat known as the Bluefin uh, in collaboration with the University of Tasmania and the Australian Maritime College. Um, and we actually set out to test if satellite tags work on saw sharks, right? To test the efficacy of these tags. Uh, and if it does work, hopefully at that point, we could also get some baseline data, right? We can get some, our first insights into really how they actually live in the wild. Do they spend a lot of time on the bottom? Do they spend a lot of time on, um, in certain areas? Because as of before this study, we had a lot of assumptions about saw sharks. We assume that they're very benthic, uh, meaning they spend a lot of the time on the bottom, and that they're very localized, which they shouldn't really, it means that they don't really move around a lot. They don't really move from their local area. That's, or I said that is, or that was, I should say, a bit of a spoiler, the assumptions that we had before we actually had a chance to look at these sharks. And to do that, we used a special kind of satellite tag known as a pop-up satellite archival tag. Um, I'll get into it a little bit in a second of how those tags work. Um, well, right now. Uh, so we actually use these tags from a company called Microwave Telemetry. So these tags are, are pretty good because um, as the name might suggest, uh, they are archival. So, well, actually, I've got some slides here in a second. We'll get into that. I'll, hopefully it'll be a bit clear of how these tags work. But these were the three um, lucky individuals who volunteered for our study, um, in, a, in a sense. <laughs> um, uh, and these are the three sharks after they had been tagged and they were recovering on board the vessel before we released them. So we tagged them. I'm not sure how much um, familiarity people have with tagging, so I'll try to provide as much information as possible. And uh, yeah, we'll have plenty of time for questions afterwards, so please uh, give us a shout or anything if you have a question. 
Um, we use the method known as the bridle method. It's by far the most common method used when tagging animals with this kind of tag, well, tagging sharks, I should say. Um, and it's essentially where a small hole is made in the base of the dorsal fin, and then a piece of monofilament is threaded through that and then crimped back together, essentially um, anchoring the tag to the shark. Yep. And what these tags actually do, let's say these sharks, um, they fully recover. We're looking at their vitality scores. They start breathing really nicely. Uh, and then we start to release them, right? So now we have our little sharky. Yep, he's off. He's just left the boat and he's swimming away. And now he has this tag. And this tag is going to record a few different um, variables for us. So first off, it's going to record temperature, which gives us an idea of temperature thresholds that this, this shark might uh, prefer. Um, it'll also record depth. So it'll give us an idea of how it's moving vertically in the water. And it also records light levels underwater. So what light levels allow us to do um, is to essentially back calculate the rough area of where the shark is or was. So this is an idea called geolocation. So you can basically measure the light levels underwater and then calculate back the rough latitude and longitude points that the shark was at during its, um, its track of movement while it, the tag was on the animal. Um, this sort of measurements, it's a bit tricky with these sharks. Again, especially once you get sharks that go um, in between like the photic zone. So the area of the ocean where light actually penetrates to. Um, so it's, it was one of the main things we were testing with this as well to see if we could actually get a good idea of horizontal movements with this tag, because it's, it's a bit of a gray area, probably literally at that level. Um, yeah, so as this works, you know, the shark is released and then it goes, it swims off. Um, all the while this tag is recording this information. Um, and eventually, um, usually through a pre-programmed uh, time, then the tag will um, come off the shark because we can't get this information back until the tag um, reaches the surface, um, which will make sense with this fun diagram. So how it actually works again is these tags are unable to transmit underwater, right? Uh, the ocean and water in general doesn't work very well for trying to, uh, to reach and talk to satellites underwater. It doesn't quite work that way. So what actually happens is this tag will then pop off the shark, usually um, from a pre-recorded or preset amount of time, the deployment time we say, um, and then it'll float to the surface and then it'll start to try to transmit all this data it was collecting or archiving to a satellite network to then we can get a little ping on our phones, we'll jump for joy because we get some data and uh, we can start to get a better idea of how these sharks were actually um, using their environment, how they were living their, their best life, hopefully. Um, so that's, in theory, how it works. Um, of course, we are talking about basically putting a computer in the ocean for months at a time. So you can imagine how things don't always go to plan. Um, but that's, that's the idea, anyways. And what this actually looks like, um, I'm going to put on a little video here in just a second, um, from our latest trip down to Tasmania, again, a little bit before uh, COVID. Um, where we had just released one of these sharks, um, but we were also trying to add a different facet to the study. We were using an ROV, which is a remotely operated vehicle. Think of essentially an underwater drone. We were doing this to try to get a better idea of how the sharks actually um, respond to the tagging and the capture events, because despite our best efforts, it's still going to be a rather stressful event for the shark. It's being pulled out of the ocean, put into tanks, and having a very minor surgery done to it. So there's lots of things that we're looking at there to try to see if we can increase the welfare of the animals, but also um, just to basically check up on the shark. So what that actually looks like is something like this. So this shark was close to the surface. We had just released it. Um, it was still slightly disoriented. Um, and we even had a little visitor come by, um, uh, which was very cool. Uh, I have to say it was also very stressful. Um, because our shark, while it is a shark, uh, it is by far and away not an apex predator. We are very much in that meso predator, middle of the food chain sort of deal. So we were very worried that this, uh, this guy was going to take a bite out of our shark. Um, thankfully, it didn't. Um, so basically, this was uh, <laughs> my supervisor and myself watching um, from the live feed from the computer as we were um, holding our collective breaths to see if the shark could actually reach to safety, which it did. We were fortunate enough to follow this shark 
uh, down to about 30 or 40 meters of depth. Um, and it picked up a lot of its activity levels and it looked quite, quite nice and healthy. And it, uh, it also managed to avoid being chomped, which is always, always welcome, seeing as these tags are not very cheap. Um, but anyways, yes, we were <laughs> very stressed to say the least. Uh, but that is essentially how the satellite tags work. This was essentially the pilot study that we carried out, tagging three sharks, releasing them, and trying to get a better idea of how they actually live in the wild. Um, and what did we actually find? Um, again, this was a, a pilot study. So it was a, an introduction to the technique to this group of animals, well, to this family of animals, actually. Um, so what we found, this map here um, is essentially our study area. Um, what we found was that we, our tags didn't record the light levels well enough, essentially. So the tags were on these animals for up to three weeks. Um, and what we found was that when these tags actually came off the animals, um, they traveled various distances, right? This is the horizontal distance that we're talking about here. So these two tags here, well, as soon as the tag popped off, looking at the depth data, it um, essentially was able to talk to the satellites right away. It gave us a little GPS ping, here I am, and that's great. And then it starts transmitting its data, fantastic. This little dot down here, um, it seems like this tag actually struggled to talk to the satellite network, so it took a little bit of time. He was still on holidays, you know, taking his time, enjoying the Tasman Sea, because as everyone knows how tropical and warm and fun that is. Um, but it's very likely this tag actually came off somewhere around here and then floated at the surface for uh, a couple days before it actually managed to transmit to the satellite. So um, in essence, what we learned from this is that um, saw sharks quite possibly are able to actually move a bit more horizontally than we really thought. Um, so after about two to three weeks, they could move almost 200 kilometers, um, which again, doesn't seem like, it, like much when you guys hop into your cars and drive up and down the coast. But if you're a little meter long shark, it's a substantial distance to travel. So it's certainly from an introductory standpoint, it's, it's very exciting for us. Because um, again, all the stuff we're finding now is quite novel. It's quite new. Um, so it's really, it's kind of exciting everywhere you turn. But the more exciting stuff for me personally, um, I am a huge saw shark fan, clearly, but the more exciting data that we actually had came looking at um, how they actually use uh, the water column, so how they actually move vertically in the water. As I mentioned, these sharks were thought to be benthic. They look very benthic. Like if you actually look at the bottom of them, they're quite flat, almost on the level of like wabagongs, because wabagongs spend all day sleeping underneath rocks waiting for divers to come take pictures of them. Um, but Saw sharks have a similar um, uh, shape on their ventral side, their bottom side is quite flat. But what we actually saw, uh, so these three graphs, each one is one shark. So this is shark one, this is shark two, this is shark three. But this, this shark here demonstrates it quite clearly is that it looks like these sharks might be going on little soirees uh, in the nighttime that we weren't expecting. So it seems, um, it seems that actually, with these blue dots being the night times and the red dots being day, it seems that they might actually be making what we call dial vertical movements. Yeah, so it's something that you see in other little fishes in the ocean that they actually at nighttime they go up into the water usually to try to feed and then they come back uh, to the bottom during the daytime for protection or hopefully to avoid larger predators. So this was really exciting for us because again, even all of the commercial fishermen I've talked to everybody pretty much shakes their head when they see this data because nobody really expected saw sharks of all things, these little, little sharks to be making such regular movements up in the water. So it was very exciting for us. Um, and while this shark displays it quite clearly, the other ones are a little bit more chaotic. There's a bit more noise there. Um, so with this sort of um, data, it's, it's promising in terms of a pilot study exploratory. Um, and we're actually carrying out a larger tagging study currently um, to try to both figure out more um, the case of the common saw shark for this study, but also on the southern saw shark as well and how they might actually interact with each other in the wild. So some pretty cool data here. And what we actually saw at the beginning as well here is um, there seems to be very little vertical movement um, right when they get released. So this is the time when they get released and this is afterwards, right? So this might be what we call a post-release response uh, as I mentioned, the tagging and the capture events can be quite stressful for the animals, so it's quite possible that um, they really just hightail it out of there, basically. They usually go to slightly deeper waters, as you can see, um, where, again, they're, they're a little bit safer.
So that's what that looks like. So again, kind of exciting. And in terms of our little pilot study here, what do we actually learn? Again, they're not as benthic as we thought. Benthic meaning essentially tied to the bottom of the ocean, right? Uh, and they appear to make these diel vertical movements. They actually like going up in the water column. And we found that satellite telemetry can work on saw sharks. Um, there's definitely ways that we're improving it, trying to find better ways to keep the tags on the animals for longer, um, trying to find ways um, to make the tags essentially smarter for our study species. And that's something we've been working on. And again, they, we think that they move more than we thought, which is all very exciting stuff. Um, and a lot of that information was, again, previously unknown. So this study was the first one to actually look at any sort of um, movement or ecology in saw sharks at all. So we're very happy about that. Um, but that actually takes us on to the second caveat of the story for today. And that's looking at trying to age saw sharks, right? How old is this shark? It's very important information for um, fisheries. Um, that's often how um, fisheries and uh, government management organizations actually calculate how much um, of a fish you can take from a population in terms of sustainability, something they call maximum sustainable yield. Um, we won't get too much into the whole policy side of everything, but this was essentially what we were trying to look at. But it takes me to the first question of how do you actually age a shark, right? They don't have passports, they don't have driver's license, they don't have birth certificates. So you can't really uh, go to the, the tried and true. So you have to come up with new ways to try to figure out how to actually um, calculate the age of a shark. Um, and how predominantly that's done in sharks is using the vertebra or the backbones of, of the animal. So if you guys have ever, you guys might be more familiar with how you actually age trees. You know, if you cut down a tree and you look at the tree trunk, you usually see rings or little bands that go out from the center. And the idea is how many rings there are, it's how old the tree is, right? Generally speaking, that's actually how it works with sharks. Um, so that's generally the idea. And how you actually go about that in terms of an experimental point of view is you don't, um, <laughs> you don't really, uh, well, we'll get into it, okay. So how it actually works with sharks, instead of cutting down the tree, you actually have to take one of these vertebra and you cut it in half, and then you cut it slightly again to get a small little section out of the center of the backbone of the vertebra, yeah? And due to the shape of shark's vertebra, you actually end up with this little bow tie-like shape, yep. Yeah? So this is the center. So it's, uh, vertebra themselves are quite concave in the center, so they come to a little point there, and you get this, um, this sort of shape when you, when you cut them. And the idea is that you'll be looking for these rings, these what we call band pairs, um, on the outside of this little edge here. This edge is what we call the corpus calcarum. Um, don't worry, there's not gonna be a test later, but that's just what we call it. Um, and in theory, again, I'm gonna say this a lot, in theory, um, that's where you should be able to find band pairs and count to see how old the shark is. Yep, too easy, happy days. So how this looks like in uh, something here, this is from a great hammerhead from a, a friend of mine, Vincent Rowlt uh, at all. They were doing some resource partitioning and um, some age work on great hammerheads here on um, Southeastern Australia. Um, you can see this is that corpus calcarum I was talking about. And when I said band pairs earlier, I should have specified this. Um, in rings and trees as well, you have periods where like uh, there's a lot of growth and then no growth, a lot of growth and no growth. So what that actually looks like on tree rings and on vertebra is you get uh, periods of this light, or maybe it's easier up here, these light spots and these dark spots here. So this is what we call band pairs. So when we talk about a single pair, it's one of each of these. So it'll be a light and a dark together. And again, in theory, this should visualize one year of growth in sharks. Yep. This is just a quick introduction to shark aging, how it's supposed to work in theory. Um, as most things go, especially living animals, they don't really want to uh, do what you tell them to do. So we'll, uh, we'll get into why I say theory a lot instead of the reality. Um, so with that in mind, we tried to apply this to saw sharks. Yep. Yeah. So we did the first time, right? We cut it in half. Um, saw sharks actually have a slightly different shape, uh, a structure of the vertebra. It's the same bow tie like shape but instead of having that solid center like the hammerheads do they actually have um, a lot of open gaps here and just these um these struts if you'll call them going across 
Um, this area is called the intermedialis, but again, uh, there's not going to be a test later. But so what we did, we did this, and then we were starting to look on this little edge here, and you might notice some differences between this and our great hammerhead is there doesn't really seem to be much going on there, right? So we were scratching our heads being like, okay, sure. Maybe we can try um, some other techniques. Maybe these band pairs are just not easy to be seen regularly. Yeah. So ways you can actually do that is actually by using different um, um, chemicals and different techniques to try to bring those band pairs out. You know, if they're not really very visible, you can do um, different kinds of stains, we call them. Um, this one's a common one called alizarin red S. Um, we did this stain and we didn't really see much bands either. So we opened up our toolkit and moved on to another stain, um, something called crystal violet. Uh, it's certainly a pretty stain to work with. Um, it'll stain your lab coat like crazy. Your fingers will be purple for a while. Um, but again, not much luck here either, looking for band pairs. Um, and then we kind of expanded it a little bit more. And instead of actually making this section that we talked about, some people had had success with actually um, staining and looking at the entire vertebra itself. So we did that, this whole centra. If you think about the vertebra looking down, um, in theory, there's band pairs that should be uh, visible here. Well, we tried this one and still no luck, right? So we're moving on, we're moving on into our techniques and we moved into something called histology. It's basically very small cuts and looking for the actual structures of these bands on a, on a, on a very, very, very microscopic level and still no luck. So at this point, my patience is, uh, is growing very thin. This is um, when my supervisor was telling me to calm down, we'll figure something out. Um, so we kept trying. This time we tried a slightly different technique. Uh, it's essentially burning. It's when you use basically temperature or charring to try to, to try to bring out those band pairs because apparently that works for some sharks, particularly blue sharks it works for. Um, then we decided to get a bit fancier. We're like, okay, well, if the easy stuff doesn't work, let's get fancy. So we tried scanning electron microscopy, right? SEM. Uh, it makes for very pretty pictures. Almost everything you take a picture on under SEM looks very nice. Um, but still, we couldn't find any band pairs. So we moved on to another one that's uh, quite novel, quite new. And we decided to do something called micro X-ray fluorescent microscopy. It's a big fancy word that essentially uses X-rays and microscopes to look for the actual chemical existence of these bands. So these bands should, in theory, be visible in their elemental signature, right? And at this point in time, still no bands. So we had a fantastic uh, experience, a very, a very thorough test of my patients and my supervisor's patients. Um, but we actually did learn quite a lot out of this. So myself, I learned a lot of new aging techniques that I didn't know beforehand, even though if they were a little bit um, uh, fruitless. But what we're learning now, um, what is already pretty well documented is that shark aging is rather species specific. So the interesting part is that saw sharks didn't actually have any visible banding. So this has been observed in other species as well, particularly when you get into species that are more in the deep sea. Um, some things like the Greenland shark is a, is a more of a famous one. Um, so for them, it has to do with basically the lack of calcification. Um, so that might be something that we're actually seeing here in saw sharks as well. But again, eight different techniques failed to age uh, saw sharks, but it kind of raises more points about uh, new techniques are actually needed for shark aging, which again, isn't specifically saw sharks. This is a couple of the sharks that really, um, we really don't know much about how long they live, which is kind of an issue when, you're, when you think about um, the fact that they're still being taken. Um, in Australia alone, there's about 300 tons of saw sharks being landed each year. Um, and we still don't really know exactly how old they live. So it's, it's definitely an area of research that um, we, we helped move forward with this study a little bit more. And there's actually some very exciting new stuff coming out of new um, microbiological, like genetic techniques, actually looking at um, the DNA of, of sharks to actually try to figure out how old they are. Um, we'll get into that too much now, but there's definitely some cool stuff going on. And I'm excited to maybe try some and apply some of that to uh, saw sharks in the near future. Um, and this takes me to the last topic for tonight, for today, wherever you are. And um, it's actually CT scanning saw sharks. So why would anybody CT scan a saw shark, right? So 
originally, this was actually tied into our aging work. So we were looking at how the vertebra actually changes along the column, right? So how it actually changes from the head to the tail, um, because there's been some work in actually how that shape might actually reflect or maybe mislead us in terms of how old a shark is. But we decided to take a bit of a novel approach, uh, something that most people don't really do. Um, so what we decided to do is actually take one of our, well, three of our saw sharks into our local uh, university hospital. Uh, and we caused quite a stir to say the least um, between the patients, uh, the doctors themselves, everyone was very excited, a little confused why there was a saw shark in their hospital. Um, but overall, they were very excited to help us with the research and we're very thankful for them. Um, and I think their, uh, their CT scan probably still smells a little bit like shark, but um, anyways, it was quite, a, quite an exciting thing for us to do. And we actually kind of found more information than we thought we would have. Um, so what we actually have here is one of the CT scans of the saw shark, one of ours. Um, and this square over here on the right is basically the rough area that we're looking at in this scan. So what I'll do now is I'll play the video uh, and I think it'll loop a couple times and you guys can have a look at it first without me saying anything and try to see what you see yourself. So we have some very cool stuff going on here. I of course was grinning ear to ear um, by the fact that we were using a CT scan on a shark. I thought this was the coolest thing in the world. The CT tech was absolutely there with us. Um, we had made up whole stories about our sharks and yeah, their whole livelihoods and everything. It was, it was quite a lot of fun. So what we're actually seeing here, I'll give a little bit of a spoiler. So we were interested again, looking at the vertebral column, right? So the backbone. And I'll see if I can pause it actually where you can see the backbone itself. So we were looking at this. So this here is the spinal column of a shark, at least a saw shark. And maybe you guys can actually see as you get this, this is kind of what you're looking at, that bow tie shape we were looking at with the aging. But essentially we were taking measurements, seeing how it actually changed all along the body. So we did a bunch of CT scans all the way down from the head to tail. And we, I measured a lot of vertebra. Um, but as we actually go deeper into the shark, we start to see a lot of other things happening here. Um, we start to see some other little vertebral columns down here, maybe a little head, a tail. Um, and when we, were, when we were actually looking at this, um, we were looking at a different dimension first. We were looking actually um, into the shark um, from a different axis. And I, I originally thought that maybe we were looking at a pregnant saw shark. Um, you see all these little vertebral columns. Um, we got very excited and everything like that. But it turns out the story actually got a bit more interesting than just a pregnant shark. Um, what it turned out to be was actually these sharks had had quite a feast before they'd actually been captured. So why this is interesting, right? Obviously sharks eat fish, right? What's interesting is more than that. So maybe if I can actually get to the next slide. Um, what we have here is the same um, CT scan, but actually um, it's a 3D reconstruction of it. So what we can actually see if I play this is you start to see a bit more of the picture here, right? So you start to see it's generally fish, right? These are something known as a banded grub fish. Um, but what we start to see is you get to see some heads, you see some tails um, and all this stuff along, right? And what we started to see was, oh, that's really cool. This shark is very full. It's also very exciting for scientists to actually find um, sharks with fish in their stomach. Um, one thing this lets us know part of their diet because most sharks, most predators you catch usually come with empty stomachs. But the cool part still wasn't quite that. The cool part was, if you notice that all of these fish are actually facing the same way. Um, this was something that we had like a very aha, kind of eureka moment, if you will. Um, so what we started to figure out is that it seems like saw sharks are actually choosing to eat fish head first. Yeah. So, which might sound kind of bizarre at first, because when most people see saw sharks, they see saw fish, they see this this big saw attached to their face, right? So they just assume that they must use that, you know, they must chop up fish with that little sashimi for them underwater, something like that, right? Um, but we're starting to see that maybe the rostrum itself is much more of a precision tool than it is uh, a destructive tool. So if you think about fish, let's say telios, your, your general fish underwater, your reef fish, 
Um, lots of people like to talk about the evolutionary arms race, right? How things start evolving, predators evolve things, prey evolve things to, to better um, counteract those things. So if you think about most fish, right? They're actually, um, they have their own little defenses. So in most fish, this actually comes to very spiny dorsal fins. Maybe if anybody's ever gone fishing and they got a fish and they were trying to release it and the fish might've accidentally stabbed them in the hand um, because they actually have these little spikes over their body to try to help them from being eaten, right? It helps um, deter predators, let's say. But it seems like soft sharks might have actually figured out a way to overcome these defenses. So if they're able to actually, um, let's say, stun a fish or even knock it with its rostrum, they might actually be able to um, then carefully and by choice actually ingest these prey head first, which is a really cool thing to see because you don't really see or even think about that much in sharks. Most people think of sharks, they think of, you know, your great whites when they're using very large teeth made for biting and tearing. While saw sharks actually have much smaller, um, still quite sharp teeth, but they're much more limited in, um, in their ability to actually um, to, to bite prey, especially with a rostrum attached to their face and their mouth underneath. So it seems like they actually might be um, ingesting their prey head first. So a very cool, cool thing for us, we were, we were definitely very stoked about that, especially in the hospital. Um, the doctors weren't sharing our enthusiasm. They were just happy to get the shark out of there, but it was very interesting. So what we found is that saw sharks do appear to ingest their prey head first. Um, this picture is actually a, a macro shot, a close-up shot of a saw shark mouth. So they do have um, shark teeth. They're true shark teeth. They're triangular, they're sharp, they're pointy, and they have rows of them that are replaced sequentially. Um, but they're limited again because they're not really able to bite and tear things very easily, as well as um, their mouths are quite small. This is what we've called being gape limited, basically how wide you can open your mouth. And that'll be directly related to what kind of fish you can eat. So if they're actually able to think about it and to ingest their prey head first, it actually maximizes the size of the fish that they're able to eat while also protecting themselves from any of the defenses of the fish that they might have. Um, and in essence, we basically found that CT scans can provide a lot more information than when you first set out. Where we were looking at the, the vertebra, the backbone of saw sharks, we actually ended up going a bit further and uh, finding a lot more about their behavioral foraging. So something that is, is hard to find out when sharks are basically spending their lives at 200 to 500 meters depth. You're not really gonna be able to, uh, to just pop down with a GoPro and have a look. So really cool information that we found. Um, and yeah, very, very lucky to, to have something like that. And um, yeah. With that, um, these are some of the papers that we're talking about today. Um, struggling with age was obviously our, <laughs> our aging uh, experience, uh, tests of patients, no doubt. Uh, and then, yep, satellite telemetry. And our last one was the most recent one uh, in fish biology about uh, CT scans and um, some of the interesting stuff that we can get, some of the inferences we can make, um, essentially secondhand. So some cool stuff there. And with that, yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you guys for having me. Thanks, Reef Check. Uh, if you guys have any questions, um, happy to help. We also have our website there and email and Twitter, whatever you guys like. I'm always happy to talk sharks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Patrick. That was awesome. And I learned heaps of new stuff, even being <laughs> uh, an animal ecologist. There's always more to learn. Yep. Thank you, Patrick, for that fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Um, so Julie's got a question. Um, are they just bycatch or do we eat them? Ah, so good question. So for those of you in Australia, you might be a bit familiar. Um, local fish and chip shops. Um, it's if you eat at your local fish and chip shop, it's quite possible that you have eaten saw shark. Um, they are quite common um, in that sort of thing. They're always labeled as flake. Flake is the generic name for shark in most um, restaurants and the culinary world in Australia. Um, so yeah, they're, they're kept for their, their flesh. So they are not, um, usually it's people targeting things like gummy sharks. That's a bit more of the, the, the actual fishery, but uh, saw sharks are kept because yeah, they're still able to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Didn't realize that. I thought you were going to say no, actually. <laughs> no, yeah, they're quite, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's a very easy yeah. fish to eat. So people do. Mm -hmm. 
I'll have to All try right. it one day. <laughs> you should try it this time. Conservationist. Um, <laughs> so we got a question from Maria. Um, do the tags interrupt the socializing because of their size? Ah, good question. So in essence, in the basics of it, I'm not sure. So in general, most sharks aren't, oh, <laughs> I won't finish that sentence. So in sharks in general are more individualistic. Um, there are social structures for sure. There's lots of social behavior between sharks. Um, I can't say definitively. I don't know if anybody's ever defined um, how other sharks, if, if sharks get judged by having a, uh, a piece of equipment, a tag. Um, but it is a big, that's a big uh, area of concern and both um, ethically, legally, and all this stuff with, um, with tagging any animal, well, any vertebrate, I should say, because um, there's always concerns of tag impacts on the animal. So you always have to, to, to carefully consider that and also maintain under certain restrictions. So it's a big question we go into, but I'm not sure about the social aspects themselves. Yeah, it can be hard to know how those tags affect their behavior. Mm, certainly. That's always kind of the, the idea as well. When you're, you're trying to analyze the data itself, you try to set up your study in a way that um, you're actually trying to look at natural behavior because it doesn't really do you much good if you've now described uh, what a shark does when it's tagged. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, because you're trying yeah. to make inferences on the, on the actual natural populations there. It's still an area that we don't know anything about is saw shark reproduction in terms of how it actually works. Because in general, it involves um, some biting um, but that might be a very difficult thing to do with saw sharks uh, having a, a, a saw attached to their face. So it's something we haven't seen ever. So it's a big question mark for us. Interesting. Um, and Maria also has another question. Actually, I was wondering about this as well. If the tags interrupt their buoyancy. Yep, sure. So three weeks is a long time to have it on the thing on their fins. Actually, three weeks is, is quite a short amount of time, to be honest, um, in terms of the general um, if you look at a lot of tagging studies. Um, so this comes back to the previous thing. So the tags themselves are um, slightly positively buoyant. Um, so in terms of weight, it depends of, um, the weight itself is quite negligible, negligible especially when you're underwater um, with the buoyancy. But the issue is, um, the main issue you wanna take into account with, um, with tags in your study is actually drag underwater. Um, because as you might imagine, if you have uh, something attached to you, this is usually a big concern as well. If you're talking about, um, you know, like ghost nets and things like that, whales are always catching a lot of attention because they're dragging around, you know, kilos of, uh, of, of nets. Um, so for sharks in general, yeah, that's more of the issue. So with saw sharks, um, I can't say for certain, we try to make it as small as possible, but in theory, it should be less less uh, affected because they're not fast swimmers. They're not burst swimmers like um, some of your faster swimming sharks. So the drag would be less if you're not trying to basically make high, high speed movements in theory. Anyways. Well, thank you. Uh, Lauren wants to know what the population status of the Australian species are and uh, if any of them have a threatened st status. Cool, great question. Um, so as of right now, um, I think they're still doing, the IUCN specialist group is actually doing, they're reevaluating the IUCN shark specialist group, I should say. Um, they're the ones who are in charge of the, um, the statuses for sharks uh, globally. Um, they're reevaluating all of them, as far as I know. But um, the common in the southern saw sharks are usually listed as least concern. Um, we... We're, we're, we're want to provide more data for them because again, we, we don't know a lot about their life history and that's usually one of the, the main things that factors in. So we're not really, in terms of the current status, it's least concern. Um, most of the species globally are actually data deficient. Um, as I mentioned, we do catch the common in the Southern here in Australia. So we actually have a bit more insight where I think the Bahamas saw shark's been seen like three times, maybe, maybe two. So, um, between these two here in Australia, and I think uh, the, J the Japanese saw sharks also a bit more, uh, they see that one a bit more as well. Yeah, it's, it's tricky with a lot of these marine 
species, isn't it? Um, I know there's quite a few shark species that have only been sighted once or twice. And like, yeah. How would you know how they're doing? <laughs> it's actually, on a side note, we did the CT scanning of these saw sharks, right? And we actually, we, we got, we reached out a friend of ours, um, a guy who does a lot of uh, skeletal work on, saw sh on sharks. Um, he actually got his hands on, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with frilled sharks. Um, so we actually, we CT scanned some frilled sharks and it is, it's, hopefully we can get into some of that at some point soon. It is really cool. They're truly ancient sharks, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. No, awesome. Um, so this is from Pablo. Uh, are they too small to attach a GoPro? So they tried this, they tried this before I got here and, um, I don't know if it was actually a GoPro. I don't know, because there's another company called Critter Cam. Um, it's kind of ones that are more designed towards, um, yeah, attaching basically small cameras like a GoPro to an animal. Um, they did it for 40 hours or something like that. Um, they basically attached it to the shark and then followed it around. Um, as far as I know, it worked, but they didn't really, they, there wasn't a whole lot of stuff they got out of it. it was. It wasn't anything like a tiger shark eating a turtle or anything like that. No. Okay. Well, you never know. <laughs> so, so sharks are doing their best. Um, let's see. Yes. Uh, Lindsay, um, when looking at the ethics of tagging, uh, do they need to ensure it won't affect their ability to eat before they are approved for use? Is there any regulation? There are tons of regulation um, uh, internationally. Um, especially in Australia, in the U.S. as well, Canada, uh, Europe has adopted a lot of, um, there's uh, ethical, so for us, there's, there's, there's entire committees at universities um, that are dedicated solely to ethics, um, to animal ethics. Again, this, this exists for vertebrates, so anything that has a spine, um, and it gets extra when you're talking about humans, as you might imagine, but um, so in terms of how does it affect their eating, so in general, you have to, you have to fill a lot of, you have to answer a lot of questions, right? These are questions that are good because they help you um, really think your study design in the best way, both for collecting data, but also for the ethical uh, use of animals. So um, I, I'm forgetting off the top of my head now, but there's general like three R's, you know, that they, they talk about. So they talk about reducing, um, reducing, uh, what is it now? I'm blanking now. But um, basically, to try to ensure that you're using the smallest amount of animals to gain the most amount of data. So if there's any other way you can actually do it, then you have to do it that way. So um, in essence, there's, it takes, there's a lot of steps involved of actually making sure that you're not just being lazy, you're not being um, cruel or anything like that, um, especially when it comes to things like surgery or any sort of um, possible pain you'll be inflicting on an animal. You have to then um, decide how you're going to mediate that, how you're going to reduce that, how you're going to treat for that, um, worrying about infections, things like that. Um, so there are lots of regulations. So thankfully, there's yeah, there's there's quite a lot of work to to make sure that people are trying to take the most ethical approach to to studying animals. It's come a long way, to be honest. Yeah. If you read some papers back in in the '60s and '70s, it's uh, it's a different world we live in. For the better, I would like to think. Right, awesome. Um, here's a tricky one from Marie. How long do they live? When is their sexual maturity reached? Ah, so one of the questions, yes. Yeah, so that was that was a lot of a lot of the stuff I tried to answer. And one of the parts that I didn't talk too much about it, but one of the reasons why it's actually quite interesting is because there actually is it's not a published study, it's a it's a, a government report where they were actually able to age saw sharks. Um, they use one of the ways that we used. That's one of the reasons why we use that one. Um, and we weren't really able to reproduce it. So it's always, it's always interesting. That's why we're talking about trying to, 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 to introduce new ways um, to age sharks because it seems like band pairs themselves are, well, this is, this is, a, whole, this is a whole can of worms, to be honest. Um, there's a bit of a debate now of the applicability, really, of band pairs because what we, what we started to see is that band pairs themselves are very species specific, um, meaning that 
even if they do have band pairs, it doesn't mean that these band pairs are actually being deposited a year at a time. So if we look at things like mako sharks, that's actually not the case. So with mako sharks, it's actually, um, as juveniles and subadults, they actually lay down, I believe it's two, two pairs per year until they reach adulthood where they actually go back to one band a year. So there's a lot of work that people have been calling more for what we call verification. So trying to actually verify species by species what the actual, basically how it works by each species. So it's, there's a lot of work to be done there. And it's, um, yeah, like I said, it's a bit of a can of worms. So what they found um, is that basically 10 to 15 years, depending on the species, is how long saw sharks live. Um, but again, there was another, yeah, there seems to be, we think they live longer than that by um, personal communications, basically. Um, sexual maturity. Um, it depends. So in terms of length, I can tell you at around 800, uh, 800 millimeters, 880 uh, centimeters is when they actually basically get mature. That's when we start finding females with um, with eggs or yolk sacs, I should say, um, which I would probably say is around five or six years, roughly. Um, and Nicholas has a question in regards to your migration figures. So two of the sharks have less sampling days. Are you planning to track them more days? Yeah, cool, great question. Glad you noticed that. So, um, oh, hey, hey Nico. Um, so what actually happened, this was a pilot study. So we used um, a technique, as I mentioned, it's called, the, it's called a bridal method. It's, it's where you basically make a small hole in the dorsal fin and you loop a monofilament um, through that. And uh, I'm suspecting that it actually might have um, come off. The tag might have come off a bit early. Um, again, you're talking about computers in the ocean. So sometimes things don't go exactly as you plan. Um, so we've actually been um, kind of experimenting with different types of attachment methods to hopefully keep them on longer. So in essence, the tags came off the shark. That's why, uh, that's why the sampling days are shorter than each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um... Anyone have, do we have any more questions from anyone? Um, How big is the gape on the saw shark? Ah, I, my, my friend did this research exactly a couple of years ago. Um, I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, if I had to give you a rough estimate, um, I'm not sure, let's go five to seven centimeters wide. Um, there is research by a guy named Vincent Raoult, who's a friend of mine. He did that research exactly, um, trying to look at a bunch of different changes and also some of the, the diet work he was trying to figure out as well. So, because again, that's, uh, that turns into what they can eat. Because that's basically, that's a rule for most of the ocean. Uh, it depends on your size will just depend on, on basically where you sit in a food chain. Mostly, of course, obviously, somebody's gonna say whale sharks and I'm gonna be like, well, fair. But, uh, and their main predator, um, not entirely certain. I would suspect, especially around Southeastern Australia, you get some, some seven gills around, they would definitely do it. Um, I would say some of the large carcarinids, so your, um, maybe even a large, uh, maybe some of the whalers possibly. Um, Cause again, they're, they're quite small. Um, sh saw sharks in general, you'll find them a meter to a meter 0.3. So um, yeah, they could be food for a couple different things. As long as they don't try to eat the salt. <laughs> but again, yeah, we've just highlighted how much we don't know about these sharks and how they're how they actually fit into their food chain. So hopefully a year or two by now, my research will be done. We'll publish some papers and we can come back and do a, a round two on reef check. Then I can be like, ah, now I have that answer. But <laughs> yeah, it's can't so, wait. It's yeah, always great to see um, these studies on these lesser known species. Mm. Um, Definitely got a lot of research ahead of you. Yeah, certainly. Now that COVID's exciting. actually relaxed as well, I can get out there. So, yeah. Well, if we have no more questions from everybody else, I have a few questions for you guys, the listeners. So, um, the first one is just where are you calling in from? If it's the Sunshine Coast, Brisbane, anywhere overseas, or the rest of Australia? 
And the second one is, how did you hear about the talk? And just before everybody darts away as well, I forgot to do it before we started. Um, we'll end the presentation and we'll take one big group photo, a virtual group photo, obviously, but it's still just as fun. So if everybody wants to start flipping their cameras on. And thank you so much for voting as well, everybody. I'll end the polling now and we can get sorted on that photo. So. Just having your cameras fine if uh, you can't have, um, I mean, just having your name is fine. If you don't wanna be, if you don't want your name to be on here, obviously um, you are more than welcome to change your name. Awesome, let me set up and wait for any last comers. Cool. Well, everybody smile. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love the backgrounds coming out of some of these. How to turn on your camera. Um, Marie, there should be a little share video button on your phone or, ah, oh, you've got it. Wonderful. Lovely to see everybody's faces after a talk of quietness. Awesome. I should have some photos there. Well, if you didn't hear it enough, Patrick, thank you once again for entertaining us on this Tuesday evening. It was super, super informative. I learned heaps, so I'm sure everybody else did as well. Yeah. Thanks for coming out, everybody, and uh, yeah. We'll see everybody next month to do the same thing. Sounds good. Thank you, Patrick. Bye.